primarily on some of the clinical components and decision making, which kind of represents the nexus of where my disciplines are, I suppose. And I'm going to posit the following thesis. And on every topic relevant to COVID policy, we ignored early data that would have narrowed uncertainty and improved policy trajectory. There isn't a single one. I think that alone is astonishing. That's a tremendous amount of consistency that few of us could rare to strive to achieve, rarely achieve in other areas of our life. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just presenting some early data that there's a very good chance that a lot of you have never heard of despite probably having non-orthodox views about COVID. So we know in a modeling scenario about infection fatality rate forecasting disease, we care about when the disease started and entered into the community, the infection fatality rate and transmission. There are three key sources of uncertainty. You miss certain variables of those, the range of possibilities in terms of both the infection fatality rate, the range of, rate of infections, and what I'm going to see at time t plus delta completely changes. So from April 6th to May 3rd, um, Tracy's government performed a blood bank survey that looked at the combined IFR in patients under, the, under 70 years of age, and the confidence interval was 0.072 to 0.2, but generally 0.089%, 0.089%. And I want you to understand that this was within about maybe 20, 30 days of a New England Journal editorial by various people that won't be named that put the IFR somewhere around 3 to 4%. Of course, they had the caveat of no doubt it'll fall, but I'm pretty sure they didn't follow up with the correction after this sort of zero survey came out. No doubt it'll fall. Similarly, when we talk about initial seeding, <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say that this entire topic of when did COVID start has been basically relegated to the notion of conspiracy. And there's an ongoing battle that's going on between this market origin as well as the lab origin. Um, I, I personally think, I, I forget the name of the famous John Stewart. I, I personally think his take on the origins of COVID is both funny and completely accurate. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, go search it um, about asking questions about how and when it came out. But we had fairly early data um, from studies that were not necessarily appreciated or put out to the public in any larger sense or considered in the academic community in any larger sense that demonstrated that there was significant spread of some kind that was occurring well before December of 2019. And it seems far more likely than not that multiple major centers um, around the world were seeded. Why it didn't explode, why it took what time to actually take place, I mean, we still don't fully understand any of this. We, all, we certainly don't have a clear understanding of why influenza always seems to occur at certain times of the year and it's hemispherically consistent. We have thoughts, but after decades of modeling and understanding and, and researching this, we don't have a clear, solid explanation. So I, I think it's okay to be comfortable with uncertainty. So face coverings and air circulation. So, you know, I, I can say with a high degree of confidence that if I wrapped all of your mucosal and oral surfaces, all your mucosal surfaces with saran wrap, I could prevent you from transmitting and getting lots of different infectious diseases. It would have the unfortunate side effect of death, but there are some risks worth taking. So when we talk about influenza and SARS-CoV-2, the, 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 thesis, the thesis that often was presented is there's so much we don't know, and that is true. There's lots of things that you don't know, but what did you know? You knew that there were both envelope single-stranded RNA viruses. You knew that there would be coastal routes of entry. We knew that they were 800 to 120 nanometers in size. We knew they have animal reservoirs. We knew that there were about 70 some odd randomized controlled trials looking at NPIs and influenza. And we had those RCTs covering 692,000 patients spanning over 15 years, including household studies and included children and adults. So from a, what are the physics of this virus, which would be the primary determinant of the efficacy of a physical barrier and a physical intervention, we had a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge. So 
one of the things we all got kind of hammered with was mechanistic studies. Two mannequins set up and the mannequins talked to each other and there was some dramatic something or other that happened with the mannequins. And they made it all sorts of graphics and Swiss cheese and Havarti and whatever. But fundamentally, most transmission occurs with submicron aerosols. Submicron aerosols are not the droplets that you, you would see people spitting on each other's or when actors get into an argument on a movie and you see that and you're like, wow, ew. Um, this is something that happens at a level that you're not visualizing. So no studies, uh, of, no mechanistic studies have been done on submicron aerosols until now, and I'm going to go over that in just a moment. But air changes per hour, another thing, this is ventilation. If you, you have lots of healthcare practitioners, and I have plenty of personal anecdotes that hopefully someone will ask in questions, where re healthcare providers were saying, look, um, we've been exposed to all this stuff, clearly something's protecting us, it's the mask. Hospital air changes per hour are about 20 times a residence. I can't speak to a public space, I don't know, it varies. How, how does a church vary? I don't know, compare it depends on the particular church, depends on the technology, but Air changes per hour are markedly different in hospitals versus residences, and any sort of extrapolation to what happens in a hospital where healthcare workers are wearing face masks to a residential setting is just not really appropriate. It's not applicable. So I said until now. So this is a collaboration with a Waterloo fluid dynamics lab that I was involved with. And basically, this is about a 13 cubic foot box. It's a source control study, meaning what is the stuff getting out of the mannequin? And these are form-fitted N95s, surgical masks, and KN95s. We ignored cloth masks. So no, no Etsy, Paw Patrol masks. So we allowed steady state to be achieved for submicron aerosols, again, where most infectious virus lives. And we, saw, and we wanted to look at what was the net reduction that we could achieve. With a well-fitted N95 mask on a mannequin made to get that mask with a pinched nose form, at, mo at most you got about a 63% reduction. KN95 is about 50%, surgical masks about 30%. Why is this relevant? For every virus, we have a minimum infectious dose. At the very least, SARS-CoV-2's minimum infectious dose is at least that of influenza and possibly quite a bit lower. If you're not able to get the amount of virus you're sending out, and this is with tidal respiration. This is not me talking. This is not me yelling. This is not me laughing. Just tidal respiration, easy breathing. If you're not able to get the amount of virus you're spewing out before a minimum, below a minimum infectious dose, you're not doing anything. And this may be potentially the disconnect between why it makes perfect sense that I put something here and it should decrease transmission, but whenever we do these RCTs, it just doesn't seem to work. Why is that? And this could be the source. I'm not positing that. I'm not saying that's the case. Oh, and no medical journal would take that. We're going to publish it in an engineering fluid dynamics journal. Um, oh, it looks like the, I think I pressed the wrong button. Can you reinitiate? Uh, no, I think I just hit the button multiple times incorrectly. <laughs> so if you can start there, thank you. Thanks. Hmm, I guess I didn't. I didn't hide them. Wow, is this like a censorship thing? What's going on? <laughs> I most certainly didn't hide them. <laughs> you want to submit it slides. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow, you, God, Heterodox Academy getting orthodox. That's spooky. Um, yeah, so this is another thing I wanted to discuss, risk messaging. This is astonishing stuff, I think, for most people when you actually present it to them, and yet it's been present since April 2020. This is actually from a Kaiser study, huge data hash from Kaiser Southern California. Basically, the x-axis is a log scale, and that's important to keep in mind. It's not linear, so it makes it more dramatic, although visually less dramatic. Um, but we all are very closely in, uh, intimated with the risk to uh, elderly people when it comes to COVID. What does it mean? And I can pontificate on this endlessly. I'm not going to. Um, but 
What's more important is for the working age population, how did the risk distribute? What was the major risk modifier? It's certainly no shock to anyone that if you have an underlying immune condition, specifically an organ transplant, which is not like garden variety immunosuppression, um, but an organ transplant, your risk is actually quite a bit elevated. For, but for the vast majority of others, um, just having cancer. Some of you have may have thought, I have hypertension, I have a chronic medical problem, I have increased risk of COVID. No, I have asthma, no. I have, um, <laughs> I have a bunion, no. So, you know, it's, I'm kidding on that one, obviously. But the point is that risk messaging was horrific, and it was meant to achieve a particular purpose, one has to assume, posit that later. But if you look at the under 60 crowd, look at what happens. Look at what happens. If your BMI is above a certain level, you are, that, that modification of risk is so severe for that individual, it's equivalent to adding 40 some odd, maybe 50 some odd years to their life. But when we're talking about the working age population, when we're talking about risk messaging, what should have been said? What do you remember being said? I'll leave it at that and we'll leave it to questions. Intubation policy. We have many people now who insist that no, we didn't deviate from how we went through and managed airways. This slide on the right, this graphic on the right was put out by the Difficult Airway Coalition. It's like a national consortium. It distributed to emergency physicians. What did it say? What is the number one thing in the upper left, given how we read in Western societies, as the most important point? Prevent spread. You don't see patient care. You don't see improved outcomes, you see prevent spread. More than that, the main point is early endotracheal intubation instead of BiPAP or high flow nasal oxygen. These are non-invasive methods where a tube isn't stuck down your throat, where your own mucosal barriers to infection and other processes and also surrender of your own mechanical control of the pressures in your airways are not compromised. Intubation does all of that. Over to the left, stay home to keep us safe. If I had a nickel, as they say, for every emergency physician or every meme on social media, someone popping up saying, stay home to keep hospital staff safe. In 2020, we had a 12% rise in cardiovascular deaths with a 34% drop in emergency department visits across the board, 70% drop in pediatric EDs. I'll keep going. In 2020, we had about 200,000 increased deaths at home. 2021, 250,000 increased deaths at home. People weren't just falling off their kitchen cabinets. 62% of 2020 excess deaths in the 25 to 44 year old age group were non-COVID. And yet the previous CDC director co-authored with another physician who shall not be named, that a majority of those were probably COVID and they just kind of died. It's not how this works. And then there's this big problem, politicized white-tailed deer. By June of 2021, 33 to 40% of upper Midwest white-tailed deer were seropositive for SARS-CoV-2. The animal world was not cooperating. They were politically motivated. MAGA white-tailed deer. Gavin Newsom, if everyone that is not vaccinated got vaccinated, we can extinguish this disease in a month, July 2021. COVID vaccines in children. So on May 20th, 2020, so that's a mistake, 2021, I downloaded um, VARES. VARES has, has a lot of imperfections. There's a lot of silliness that's entered into VARES. Uh, but one month into the 12 to 15 year old rollout, I downloaded what was there. I did that because at that point, there was a significant number of vaccinations and then still you were able to screen it with simple text commands. Um, I wrote some macros into Excel. It was still a small enough number you could actually manage it and manually screen it. And I got rid of anything that had any lay terminology, even if it was tagged as serious or like I passed out, it's like, okay, that means nothing. You know, get rid of those sorts of things. It's, it's not, those are not significant events. The observed AE rate was about 0.002% to 0.01%. The estimated trial power deficit, if I calculated from that, 
where an AE rate of those two ranges, it was either 26 to 162 fold, 62 fold too small to detect one adverse event with a 95% certainty. COVID vaccines and myocarditis. This is actually a very, I, I, I like this graphic in this study in particular for some Providence healthcare system, which you may or may not know spans over many states, particularly in the Northwest. Um, and this basically shows that through 2020, you can watch their myocarditis, pericarditis rates among their healthcare workers, and then something happens in January of 2021. Something, something. And you can see that ED volumes didn't dramatically increase, thereby increasing the denominator whereby that would have happened. That didn't happen either. The study was out there. And just so you know, my own personal decisions were based upon this sort of data that I was reading and going through. So in conclusion, I would say the Academy got almost everything wrong, but at least it was wrong consistency, consistently. That level of consistency requires an alternative explanatory variable for the pattern of judgment and inference. And we still haven't learned. This is a quote unquote prominent um, science infectious disease journalist, Lori Garrett, um, Pulitzer Prize winning. Is there a single award that hasn't been defamed in some way, shape, or fashion over the last four years. But anyway, to the left of you, um, to, on the left side of your, or I guess it'd be your right, on your right is a heat map of COVID deaths. On your left is a heat map of severe obesity in the US. What do you see? But here, Lori Garrett, this chart says it all. Arizona had the highest COVID death rate and opposed most mandates and epidemic control measures. Policies and politics matter. And she's correct, but I don't think in the way she thinks. <laughs>